Chapter Four, Part One of The Voyage Out by Virginia Woolf. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Next morning, Clarissa was up before any one else. She dressed and was out on deck, breathing the fresh air of a calm morning, and making the circuit of the ship for the second time. She ran straight into the lean person of Mr. Grice, the steward. She apologized and at the same time asked him to enlighten her. What were those shiny brass stands for, half glass on the top? She had been wondering and could not guess. When he had done explaining, she cried enthusiastically, I do think that to be a sailor must be the finest thing in the world. And what do you know about it? said Mr. Grice, kindling in a strange manner. Pardon me. What does any man or woman brought up in England know about the sea? They profess to know, but they don't. The bitterness with which he spoke was ominous of what was to come. He led her off to his own quarters, and, sitting on the edge of a brass-bound table, looking uncommonly like a seagull with her white tapering body and thin alert face, Mrs. Dalloway had to listen to the tirade of a fanatical man. Did she realize, to begin with, what a very small part of the world the land was? How peaceful, how beautiful, how benignant in comparison the sea! The deep waters could sustain Europe unaided if every earthly animal died of the plague tomorrow. Mr. Grice recalled dreadful sights which he had seen in the richest city of the world men and women standing in line hour after hour to receive a mug of greasy soup. And I thought of the good flesh down here waiting and asking to be caught. I'm not exactly a Protestant, and I'm not a Catholic, but I could almost pray for the days of popery to come again, because of the fasts. As he talked he kept opening drawers and moving little glass jars, here were the treasures which the great ocean had bestowed upon him. Pale fish in greenish liquids, blobs of jelly with streaming tresses, fish with lights in their heads they lived so deep. They have swum about among bones, Clarissa sighed. You're thinking of Shakespeare, said Mr. Grice, and taking down a copy from a shelf well lined with books, recited in an emphatic nasal voice. Full fathom five thy father lies. A grand fellow Shakespeare, he said, replacing the volume. Clarissa was so glad to hear him say so. Which is your favorite play? I wonder if it's the same as mine. Henry V, said Mr. Grice. Joy, cried Clarissa, it is. Hamlet was what you might call too introspective for Mr. Grice. The sonnet's too passionate. Henry V was to him the model of an English gentleman, but his favorite reading was Huxley, Herbert Spencer, and Henry George, while Emerson and Thomas Hardy he read for relaxation. He was giving Mrs. Dalloway his views upon the present state of England, when the breakfast bell rung so imperiously that she had to tear herself away, promising to come back and be shown his seaweeds. The party, which had seemed so odd to her the night before, was already gathered round the table, still under the influence of sleep, and therefore uncommunicative. But her entrance sent a little flutter like a breath of air through them all. "'I've had the most interesting talk of my life,' she exclaimed, taking her seat beside Willoughby. "'Do you realize that one of your men is a philosopher and a poet?' A very interesting fellow, that's what I always say, said Willoughby, distinguishing Mr. Grice. Though Rachel finds him a bore. He's a bore when he talks about currents, said Rachel. Her eyes were full of sleep, but Mrs. Dalloway still seemed to her wonderful. I've never met a bore yet, said Clarissa. And I should say the world was full of them, exclaimed Helen. But her beauty, which was radiant in the morning light, took the contrariness from her words. I agree that it's the worst one can possibly say of anyone, said Clarissa, 
how much rather one would be a murderer than a bore she added with her usual air of saying something profound one can fancy liking a murderer it's the same with dogs some dogs are awful bores poor dears it happened that richard was sitting next to rachel she was curiously conscious of his presence and appearance his well-cut clothes his crackling shirt-front his cuffs with blue rings round them and the square-tipped very clean fingers with the red stone on the little finger of the left hand we had a dog who was a bore and knew it he said addressing her in cool easy tones he was a sky terrier one of those long chaps with little feet poking out from their hair like like caterpillars no like sofas i should say well we had another dog at the same time a black brisk animal a shipper key i think you call them you can't imagine a greater contrast the sky so slow and deliberate looking up at you like some old gentleman in the club as much as to say you don't really mean it do you and the shipper key as quick as a knife i liked the sky best i must confess there was something pathetic about him the story seemed to have no climax what happened to him rachel asked that's a very sad story said richard lowering his voice and peeling an apple he followed my wife in the car one day and got run over by a brute of a cyclist was he killed asked rachel but clarissa at her end of the table had overheard don't talk of it she cried it's a thing i can't bear to think of to this day surely the tears stood in her eyes that's the painful thing about pets said mr dalloway they die the first sorrow i can remember was for the death of a dormouse i regret to say that i sat upon it still that didn't make one any the less sorry here lies the duck that samuel johnson sat on eh i was big for my age then we had canaries he continued a pair of ring doves a lemur and at one time a martin did you live in the country rachel asked him we lived in the country for six months of the year when i say we i mean four sisters a brother and myself there's nothing like coming of a large family sisters particularly are delightful dick you were horribly spoilt cried clarissa across the table no no appreciated said richard rachel had other questions on the tip of her tongue or rather one enormous question which she did not in the least know how to put into words the talk appeared too airy to admit of it please tell me everything that was what she wanted to say he had drawn apart one little chink and showed astonishing treasures it seemed to her incredible that a man like that should be willing to talk to her he had sisters and pets and once lived in the country she stirred her tea round and round the bubbles which swam and clustered in the cup seemed to her like the union of their minds the talk meanwhile raced past her and when richard suddenly stated in a jocular tone of voice i'm sure miss vinrace now has secret leanings towards catholicism she had no idea what to answer and helen could not help laughing at the start she gave however breakfast was over and mrs dalloway was rising i always think religions like collecting beetles she said summing up the discussion as she went up the stairs with helen one person has a passion for black beetles another hasn't it's no good arguing about it what's your black beetle now i suppose it's my children said helen ah that's different clarissa breathed do tell me you have a boy haven't you isn't it detestable leaving them it was as though a blue shadow had fallen across a pool their eyes became deeper and their voices more cordial instead of joining them as they began to pace the deck rachel was indignant with the prosperous matrons who made her feel outside their world and motherless and turning back she left them abruptly
She slammed the door of her room and pulled out her music. It was all old music, Bach and Beethoven, Mozart and Purcell, the pages yellow, the engraving rough to the finger. In three minutes she was deep in a very difficult, very classical fugue in A, and over her face came a queer, remote, impersonal expression of complete absorption and anxious satisfaction. Now she stumbled, now she faltered, and had to play the same bars twice over. But an invisible line seemed to string the notes together, from which rose a shape, a building. She was so far absorbed in this work, for it was really difficult to find how all these sounds should stand together, and drew upon the whole of her faculties that she never heard a knock at the door. It was burst impulsively open, and Mrs. Dalloway stood in the room, leaving the door open, so that a strip of the white deck and of the blue sea appeared through the opening. The shape of the Bach fugue crashed to the ground. "'Don't let me interrupt,' Clarissa implored. "'I heard you playing, and I couldn't resist. I adore Bach.' Rachel flushed and fumbled her fingers in her lap. She stood up awkwardly. "'It's too difficult,' she said. "'But you were playing quite splendidly. I ought to have stayed outside.' "'No,' said Rachel. She slid Cooper's letters and Wuthering Heights out of the armchair, so that Clarissa was invited to sit there. "'What a dear little room,' she said, looking round. "'Oh, Cooper's letters. I've never read them. Are they nice?' "'Rather dull,' said Rachel. He wrote awfully well, didn't he?" said Clarissa. If one likes that kind of thing. Finished his sentences and all that. Wuthering Heights. Ah, that's more in my line. I really couldn't exist without the Brontes. Don't you love them? Still, on the whole, I'd rather live without them than without Jane Austen. Lightly and at random, though she spoke, her manner conveyed an extraordinary degree of sympathy and desire to befriend. Jane Austen? I don't like Jane Austen, said Rachel. You monster! Clarissa exclaimed. I can only just forgive you. Tell me why. She's so, so, well, so like a tight plait. Rachel floundered. Ah, I see what you mean, but I don't agree and you won't when you're older. At your age I only liked Shelley. I can remember sobbing over him in the garden. He has outsoared the shadow of our night. Envy and calumny, and hate and pain, you remember? Can touch him not, and torture not again, from the contagion of the world's slow stain. How divine! and yet what nonsense she looked lightly round the room i always think it's living not dying that counts i really respect some snuffy old stockbroker who's gone on adding up column after column all his days and trotting back to his villa at brixton with some old pug dog he worships and a dreary little wife sitting at the end of the table and going off to Margate for a fortnight. I assure you I know heaps like that. Well, they seem to me really nobler than poets whom everyone worships, just because they're geniuses and die young. But I don't expect you to agree with me. She pressed Rachel's shoulder. Um, she went on quoting, unrest which men miscall delight. When you're my age, you'll see that the world is crammed with delightful things. I think young people make such a mistake about that, not letting themselves be happy. I sometimes think that happiness is the only thing that counts. I don't know you well enough to say, but I should guess you might be a little inclined to, when one's young and attractive. I'm going to say it. Everything's at one's feet. She glanced round as much as to say, not only a few stuffy books and Bach. I long to ask questions, she continued. You interest me so much, 
If I'm impertinent, you must just box my ears. And I, I want to ask questions, said Rachel with such earnestness that Mrs. Dalloway had to check her smile. Do you mind if we walk, she said? The air's so delicious. She snuffed it like a racehorse as they shut the door and stood on deck. Isn't it good to be alive, she exclaimed, and drew Rachel's arm within hers. Look, look, how exquisite. The shores of Portugal were beginning to lose their substance, but the land was still the land, though at a great distance. They could distinguish the little towns that were sprinkled in the folds of the hills, and the smoke rising faintly. The towns appeared to be very small in comparison with the great purple mountains behind them. Honestly, though, said Clarissa, having looked, I don't like views. They're too inhuman. They walked on. How odd it is, she continued impulsively. This time yesterday we'd never met. I was packing in a stuffy little room in the hotel. We know absolutely nothing about each other. And yet I feel as if I did know you. You have children. Your husband was in Parliament? You've never been to school, and you live with my aunts at Richmond. Richmond? You see, my aunts like the park. They like the quiet. And you don't. I understand, Clarissa laughed. I like walking in the park alone, but not with the dogs, she finished. No, and some people are dogs, aren't they? said Clarissa as if she had guessed a secret. But not everyone. Oh, no, not everyone. Not everyone, said Rachel, and stopped. I can quite imagine you walking alone, said Clarissa, and thinking, in a little world of your own. But how you will enjoy it, some day. I shall enjoy walking with a man. Is that what you mean? said Rachel regarding Mrs. Dalloway with her large inquiring eyes. I wasn't thinking of a man particularly, said Clarissa, but you will. No, I shall never marry, Rachel determined. I shouldn't be so sure of that, said Clarissa. Her sidelong glance told Rachel that she found her attractive, although she was inexplicably amused. Why do people marry? Rachel asked. That's what you're going to find out, Clarissa laughed. Rachel followed her eyes and found that they rested for a second on the robust figure of Richard Dalloway, who was engaged in striking a match on the sole of his boot, while Willoughby expounded something which seemed to be of great interest to them both. There's nothing like it, she concluded. Do tell me about the Ambroses, or am I asking too many questions? I find you easy to talk to, said Rachel. The short sketch of the Ambroses was, however, somewhat perfunctory, and contained little but the fact that Mr. Ambrose was her uncle. Your mother's brother? When a name has dropped out of use, the lightest touch upon it tells. Mrs. Dalloway went on. Are you like your mother? No, she was different, said Rachel. She was overcome by an intense desire to tell Mrs. Dalloway things she had never told anyone, things she had not realized herself until this moment. I am lonely, she began. I want... She did not know what she wanted, so that she could not finish the sentence, but her lip quivered. But it seemed that Mrs. Dalloway was able to understand without words. I know, she said actually putting one arm round Rachel's shoulder. When I was your age, I wanted too. No one understood until I met Richard. He gave me all I wanted. He's man and woman as well. Her eyes rested upon Mr. Dalloway, leaning upon the rail, still talking. Don't think I say that because I'm his wife. I see his faults more clearly than I see anyone else's. What one wants in the person one lives with is that they should keep one at one's best. I often wonder what I've done to be so happy, 
she exclaimed, and a tear slid down her cheek. She wiped it away, squeezed Rachel's hand, and exclaimed, How good life is! At that moment, standing out in the fresh breeze, with the sun upon the waves and Mrs. Dalloway's hand upon her arm, it seemed indeed as if life which had been unnamed before was infinitely wonderful and too good to be true. Here Helen passed them, and seeing Rachel arm in arm with a comparative stranger, looking excited, was amused, but at the same time slightly irritated. But they were immediately joined by Richard, who had enjoyed a very interesting talk with Willoughby, and was in a sociable mood. Observe my Panama, he said, touching the brim of his hat. Are you aware, Miss Vinrace, how much can be done to induce fine weather by appropriate headdress? I have determined that it is a hot summer day. I warn you that nothing you can say will shake me. Therefore I am going to sit down. I advise you to follow my example. Three chairs in a row invited them to be seated. Leaning back, Richard surveyed the waves. That's a very pretty blue, he said, but there's a little too much of it. Variety is essential to a view. Thus, if you have hills, you ought to have a river. If a river, hills. The best view in the world, in my opinion, is that from Boar's Hill on a fine day. It must be a fine day, mark you. A rug? Oh, thank you, my dear. In that case you have also the advantage of associations, the past. Do you want to talk, Dick, or shall I read aloud? Clarissa had fetched a book with the rugs. Persuasion, announced Richard, examining the volume. That's for Miss Vinrace, said Clarissa. She can't bear our beloved Jane. That, if I may say so, is because you have not read her, said Richard. She is incomparably the greatest female writer we possess. She is the greatest, he continued, and for this reason. She does not attempt to write like a man. Every other woman does. On that account, I don't read em. Produce your instances, Miss Vinrace, he went on, joining his fingertips. I'm ready to be converted. He waited while Rachel vainly tried to vindicate her sex from the slight he put upon it. "'I'm afraid he's right,' said Clarissa. "'He generally is. The wretch!' End of chapter 4, part 1